you know, the payroll now is projected to be in the neighborhood of $384 million. I want to repeat that again. $384 million is what the Mets payroll is projected at the moment. And then there's the luxury tax on top of that, which is going to be uh, in the neighborhood of $111 million. And Andy, I know when Steve was announced as the owner and he held his initial press conference, he said he's going to build this team incrementally, wanted to win quickly, but wanted to do it the right way and wasn't going to spend. I believe the wording was like a drunken sailor. Um, but man, the, the, the numbers here are staggering. And so <laughs> yeah. your thought process on how we've gone from that point to this point. Well, that sailor's gone from buzz to drunk to totally blacked out here. He's stumbling around. No idea where he is. <laughs> we've we've certainly gone past where where uh, what we expected to see and what the Mets expected to see. Look, realistically, and I've watched the evolution of this. Um, I'll I'll t I'll give a somewhat detailed answer to that because it's a fascinating question about how Cohen's evolved on this. Uh, when he came in with Sandy Alderson as president, they felt that the spot for them year one after barely getting approved by owners who were concerned that he would do what he's doing now. Uh, year one, they were not going to be the top payroll. They weren't necessarily interested in going over that luxury tax right away. They were somewhat conservative out of the gate, signing like James McCann instead of JT Real Muto, not going for top of the market on everything, looking for value. Uh, the place where you could really see the Sandy Alderson influence there. Um, moving forward, Cohen then spent on Lindor, spent on Scherzer, was establishing himself as someone who's ready to take it to that next level. But even a few weeks ago, no, no, um, it wasn't spin. It wasn't like something the Mets were just saying. They legitimately at the highest levels wanted to be under that $293 million Cohen tax for this coming year. Not because Steve Cohen can't afford it. Uh, he, when he buys Carlos Correa, I'm not sure what the analogy is in our lives, but it's, it doesn't, I, I don't think he feels it. I don't, it, I know this is the way it's been described to me by others. It's not like $300 million uh, means that he's buying fewer Christmas presents for his family or that the lights go out in, in Greenwich. He's, he's, it's not a financial issue. It's more like he didn't want to be hundred million dollars over the next team, but they thought that was a little embarrassing. Uh, they didn't want to, he didn't want to fall into exactly what everyone thought he was going to do. Uh, and they want, he wanted to sort of behave within the parameters of the game, but be the highest payroll, but not like runaway spending. What we saw when we got to the winter meetings was the runaway spending that the Mets perceived from some other organizations. And we've talked about this before. Steve and I and Jim talked about it on Hot Stove that week as it was developing. Really, those few days at the winter meetings after the Verlander signing, we saw Trey Turner go for $300 million. We saw other players go for huge money, Aaron Judge, Xander Bogarts. Steve Cohen was like, all right, forget it. I guess I got to do runaway spending. And that's really what happened. And yeah. once you're there, considering it's not a hardship for him financially, all right, all right, bring on Correa. Bring on what, whatever else can we do. It sort of becomes like let's not take any half measures once, once we're there. So that's how it's evolved over the past three years or so. Yeah, I mean, it's a great overview. And, and by the way, it's the right call. Like if you're this far in and it's not something that – you can't do why wouldn't you do it right uh, the one thing i will add though is that for the most part this has been targeted smart spending you look at the overall numbers and and listen i said it they've spent over 800 million dollars committed over 800 million dollars in payroll this off season alone we know we have never seen anything like this again in the history of north american professional sports but aside from the correa deal they actually have a ton of flexibility moving forward beyond these next couple of years. And so, um, you know, I, I think still at the end of the day, the plan is still in place here to build up a farm system and have players from within fill in. But, you know, they saw an opportunity in Correa. They're getting him at a, an AAV just north of $26 million. That's perfectly logical for a player of his caliber. And beyond that, they don't have many commitments uh, beyond the next two seasons. And so this team is still in a really good spot flexibility-wise. And the other thing, too, it's just it's worth keeping an eye on now, is you wonder what happens with some of these players that last offseason was unwilling to trade. I know I said they, they want to build up the farm system, but, okay, on the left side of your infield now, if you've got Lindor and Correa for the next decade plus, right, um, maybe that changes the calculus with a guy like a Brett Beatty or, or Mark Vientos. Maybe you're more willing to – 
include him in a big time deal at the deadline to put you over the top at some point.